Now let's pray together. Father, we ask that you would attend to our time. That you would honor your name through your word. And as we hear from you, as we look at what you have for us this morning through this passage, Lord, may it attend to our hearts, may it challenge us and encourage us and cause us to change into the Christ-likeness that you desire. Unto your glory and unto your praise we pray, amen. Amen. Let's take our Bibles this morning and open them to Luke chapter 15, Luke chapter 15. I don't know about you, but this has been such a profound study for me, and it's a joy really to bring what I've learned in my own study to all of us. It has been transformational in my own thinking in in the reality about the subtle danger of self-righteousness. The reality of how self-righteousness can lodge itself in the heart. Self-righteousness, of course, can be manifested in a whole host of ways in life. And of course, the obvious and most prevalent way that we see, particularly in the Scriptures, is in those who we know when Jesus was on the earth and who were the leaders in the Judaism of the day, and that was the Pharisees. The religious leaders of the day who who were the teachers and protectors of religious practice. A religious practice that had, in fact, convinced them that by doing religious things, by keeping the biblical law to the letter, that they were then therefore righteous before God. And of course, as people, as you and I today study the Word of God, we know that the Scriptures are the Word of God and we can see the danger of that kind of thinking in any religion. Failure at perfect obedience. Failure to keep things perfectly is inevitable at all kinds of levels. And so to continue in the deceptive belief that one is religious because they strive at keeping some religious practice is simply to be self-deceived by one's own life. To be blinded by the illusion of one's own efforts at being righteous, good. Why? Because the reality is that every person continues to fail in a perfect duty. And therefore, the need for continual modification is necessary to the practice of religious activity in order to appease a guilty conscience. A guilty conscience by which God has put in all of us by His very creation. And the conscience that knows that it has failed and therefore it is not righteous. And so, there's this continual editing process that takes place as to the standard. The standard by which I define my goodness. The standard by which I define my maturity. The the standard by which... Religious practice is exercise so that one can continue to believe that if I do those things, therefore then I am righteous when, in fact, I'm not. This happens all the time in our world. It happens, in fact, both in formal religion as well as with the irreligious. Even rank pagans will convince themselves That because of how they live, that God will not judge them. After all, they will go about convincing themselves by their life that they are good enough. That's the standard of their righteousness. If I'm good, then I am good with the eternal judge. And of course... We understand that no one is righteous before a holy God. We understand that. We are here 
as those who profess to know Jesus Christ. We understand that because no one can be perfect, they cannot stand before a holy God unless they are perfect. And therefore, because they're not perfect, they will be judged for their imperfection, their sin. And unless one repents of their sinful self-righteousness, they will die an eternal conscious death in their sin. Jesus even told the Pharisees, listen, if you don't believe in me, you will die in your sin. And so a Pharisaical heart is eternally deadly. But it isn't only the unbeliever that can exercise a Pharisaical heart. Even those who are genuinely saved can exercise their life in a way that is pharisaical. We who are believers can live self-righteously. And I guess this is the subtlety that I'm, I'm seeing within the study of our text. The subtlety with which I, I want all of us to be concerned about or to be thinking about. Because it is far too easy for us as Christians to just push ourselves out of the way when we look at this text. To read it almost as if it's some kind of nice Aesop story. Some kind of fable in the Bible. Not, not necessarily an untruth. Jesus certainly is speaking truth. But, but we certainly don't have ourselves in the text. Because Jesus is clearly exposing the self-righteous hearts of the Pharisees who have rejected any relationship or any need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ in their lives. They're unbelievers. And so, you can read this text and, and easily just sit on the sidelines and watch what's happening. But with all that said and known, we have to not remove ourselves too far from the implications. Because it is tragically easy for us to exercise a pharisaical heart as Christians. We too can live self-righteously. Not, not necessarily in the sense that we believe our salvation relies on what we do. We, we understand justification is by faith alone, that it is in Christ alone, it is by grace alone, it is according to the gospel alone. We, we certainly believe that, and so we would never rightly or consciously attach our justification to our works, but, but as Christians we can become very pharisaical in our walk of sanctification. In other words, in our pursuit of holiness, in our living out Christ's likeness and all that would grow us in that process. And we can be very apathetic. We can grow apathetic to the process of growing in Christ's likeness simply because of a pharisaical heart, simply because of a heart that believes and is deceived into believing that I'm already fully sanctified as a Christian, that I'm mature enough. And surely we would never say those words, and yet often our practice, how we live, shows the same pharisaical heart we see here in this text. Because, while I may be very faithful in hearing truth regularly in my life, I'm not someone who, who simply will just disregard my Christian profession and, and not be around the things of God and the people of God and the truth of God. I, I listen to the truth or I hear the truth regularly in my life and in my Christian practice I hear the truth, but yet I rarely actually listen unto obedience to it. Why? Because I'm already good enough. I'm already a Christian. Well, I want to caution us because that is the same root cause in the heart of the unbeliever. 
It is just being manifested in the life of a believer. Both have no need for Jesus. One ends obviously in eternal destruction, and the other one ends in immaturity, stagnation, professing to be a Christian who doesn't grow past spiritual infancy. Always hearing, but never listening. And of course, this is what Jesus has been graciously putting before the people that he is speaking with and the religious leaders of the day. Those penetrating and devastatingly cautious words that he says at the end of verse 35 in chapter 14, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, take heed to what is being said, check your own life, check your own heart, and if there be this distancing, this unwillingness, then repent of it and return to the Father when that sin is exposed. And the best way that Jesus chose to expose this was by way of a parable. And we've been... We've been making our way through this specific parable and the words that he lays down here in verses 11 through 32 as recorded by Luke. And this morning we are returning to it so that we can come to the final section, verse 25 through 32. Let me read it for us. Now, his older son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him, but he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours, and yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him? And he said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live, was lost and has been found. Another son, another shocking reality. We've already looked intently at the younger son. The younger brother in this story makes an unimaginable demand of his father. He asks for his share of the inheritance. He would have been given one-third of it. The older son would have been slotted to get two-thirds of the inheritance, being the older son. And so he demands of his father, you give me what is mine, and the outcome really is an unsurprising one as he squanders all that he has been given only to find himself in that place that all of us need to be, that undesired desperation. He's blinded by his own sinful heart. He could have never guessed that his condition would become so desperate. Sinful blindness does that. It never calculates what is to come because it's not looking any farther than self. And so, he does not realize where he will end up and yet by the miracle of God's grace he is brought to his senses. God has opened his eyes to his condition and because he was made spiritually alive he determines to seek restoration with the father 
All of that was shocking. The Pharisees who were listening to this would have stood there in their arrogant pride because that's what the Pharisaical heart does. It hears those kinds of things and says, whatever. And of course, as shocking as his sin was and how it brought shame upon the entire family, it was even more shocking to see how the father responded. It was an unfathomable restoration with the son because the father had always been desiring it. The father had always wanted that kind of restoration. He had been watching. He had been waiting. And when the time had come, he showed the son with, he showers him with compassion. He restores him as one of his own. He lavishly loves him. As prodigal as the son was in squandering his riches, so much more so was prodigal the grace of God. It was an unfathomable restoration. He even took on the shame of the son as he ran to him through the town so that he might know how great a love he had for this lost soul. All of that is profound. All of it is shocking to us. All of it certainly causes us to think about our own salvation and the own way in which God has treated us as prodigal as we were. And all of it causes us to really search our own hearts and recall all of the details of the salvation as God has called us to Himself. How we were squandering our own lives in sin. And yet God was patiently waiting He causes us to see our sin and we turn to Him. We come to Him to confess our sin and the prodigal grace of God is poured out upon us through His own sacrificial love for us. He makes us His own. It's really shocking. Now, this is the other son. The older son. The older brother. And his life is not much different from that of his younger brother. Why? Because he too is lost. In his self-righteousness, certainly he thinks he's not, and yet he is lost, but he is lost while living under all of the privilege of the Father's house. And so we might ask ourselves, how? How? How could it be that he is lost while seemingly attached to the Father. There's only one answer in this entire text, and it's simply this. He has a Pharisaical heart. He has a Pharisaical heart. His self-righteousness is there. It has been there all along, and yet here, now, it is on full display. It is being exposed. While he believes he's attached to the Father, he is not attached at all. He actually doesn't even love the Father. And so, there is a major difference between the sons. They are both fools, of course, in their sin. They are both the rejectors of truth. Because of their sinfulness, they are both self-sufficient in their own sin. Both are lost. But the difference, and the only difference, is that this son refuses to see his need. Because he refuses to see his need, he refuses to turn from it. That's the only difference. As we move through this, we're going to see, really, the anatomy of unbelief. The anatomy of unbelief, but, but I want to frame it by means of how the Lord gives it to us here. And so I want to outline this section for us in this way. First, the incident itself, verses 25 to 27. Secondly, the interaction that takes place in verse 28 through 30. And then lastly, the response in verse 31 and 32. 
Because all through all of this, all through this, the anatomy of unbelief is shown in all of its deception. So let's just begin with the incident itself, verses 25 to 27. Now the older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he summons one of the servants, <coughs> excuse me, and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. It's not really difficult for us to follow as narratives go since the younger brother has been gone. The younger brother left some time ago. The older son has been striving at keeping all of the rules. He has been doing his dutiful best to live in such a way as to show himself as just that. The dutiful son. He has been serving his father, it says. And by his own estimation, that means following the rules. Doing the duty. Carrying out the dutiful activity. And so he's been going about his life working out in the field. Busy. Busy with all kinds of effort. This is certainly the pharisaical heart in practice. Dutiful at work. Busy with religious activity. The self-righteous are always great workers of religious practice. Self-righteous are always busy in religion. And when he comes toward the house, as he's making his way home from his work, he hears music. It's an interesting way in which Jesus says this here. The whole terminology there in the end where it says he heard music and dancing, it's where we get our word symphony from. It's the root word of a symphony. It's a symphonic playing that's going on. In other words, there's a great rejoicing going on. And of course, because of his own self-righteousness, because of his own pharisaical heart, he's curious about it. Wonder what's happening. What could all the celebration be? I'm the only one at home as a child. I'm the only one here that really deserves this. I'm the only one worthy of celebration. You say, how do you know that? Well, we'll see that in a moment. If it's not for me, then what's going on? And so he summons another servant of the home and inquires what's happening. Verse 26, what, what are these things happening? What, what could be going on? It's a massive celebration. There is a symphony in the home. There are instruments playing. People are rejoicing. All of, the, all of this is happening all at one time. Why didn't he just enter and see? Well, give him the benefit of the doubt for a moment. He just came in from the field. He just came in from probably following oxen around, tending the field, watching the livestock, whatever it was. Maybe he just needs to clean up first. Maybe that's what's on his mind. Maybe he's just thinking, hey, listen, I want to go in, but I'm a little dirty. Let somebody tell me what's happening so I can go clean myself up first and make my way into the house, be presentable. Maybe that's why he asked it. He's perplexed. In his mind, all of this is completely out of place with what he would expect as he comes back from his efforts. Why? Because the pharisaical heart always just simply sees himself. And that's what he sees. He sees his service. He sees his own righteousness, his own efforts. The only one who could be celebrated would be him. But that's not what he hears. Verse 27, the servant says to him, Your brother has come. Shock. But on top of that shock, your father has killed the fattened calf. What? Shock number two. 
He's received him back safe and sound. Shock number three. It's not about you. It's about the one you hate. And it's a grand celebration. This is great news. The celebration is commensurate with what has taken place. Your brother is back. Your father has commanded a celebration. Instead of making him pay for his foolish life, instead of giving him what he actually deserves by way of the sin he has committed, he has been by your father graciously forgiven. Surely the words of this servant would have come with the implication all that's left for the party is for you to come and enjoy it with us. In other words, all that's needed now to complete the celebration is for you to be here too. Won't you just come? Won't you join it? There's that three letter word again. But, only this time it's not describing God as we saw in our last study. This is not describing God. It's describing the sinful, pharisaical heart that has been hiding for years. It's describing what is actually underneath. It's being unearthed so that all can see it. So that not only the Pharisees that are standing there that day would be exposed for who they were and all their hypocritical nature, but everyone else would be exposed in their own heart as well. And I hope and trust that all of us in our own Pharisaical ways will be exposed by it. The same wickedness that was shown in his brother's life is in his heart also. It's just that he's been deceived by it. The deceptive potential of religious practice has deceived him. And by his own duty, he has convinced himself that he's the one worthy. He's the one whom God should be praising. He's the one whom should have the celebration. But all of this just exposes who he is. Exposes his heart. And so, out of his unmitigated spiritual blindness, flows his unrighteous anger. Verse 28, he became angry. The word there is orge, it's wrath, heated wrath. Explosive wrath. That which has been boiling for a long time down deep like a volcanic eruption comes out. He is angry. The heart is filled with that wrath. He can't rejoice at all. Ever since the younger brother left with all of the goods, with hating everything about the family, bitterness has simply settled in his heart and nothing can come out but his anger. This is who he is. His self-righteous heart is angry. Surely, surely this is what happens in the pharisaical heart. We feed the bitterness. We feed the bitterness even though we carry on in our own religious self-righteous works. And because it's a bitter heart, this son doesn't have any understanding of the undeserved grace and forgiveness of God. He can't see it at all why his love for the Father is only lip service, that's all. It's just lip service, it's just words. It's just words. In this, in this entire parable, this is the only section where a self-righteous pharisaical heart could actually go, yes, I agree with all of that. Everything else thus far has been complete shock. No way would God do that. No way would a father ever do that in that society. It's all 
Shocking. And now it's as if someone is finally making sense to the Pharisaical heart. Honor needs to be restored. And this son, the older son, he's about to restore it. Both the son, the younger brother, and now my father, they've both acted shamefully. It needs to be set straight. It needs to be righted. And this son is unwilling to enter this sham celebration. Why? He's lost. He's lost. He's blinded by his own sin and he refuses to see it. Anger is such a fog in his heart. Something he's been ministering to for years. The father doesn't give him what he wants. And so he tamps it down. Seeming to be righteous, but he's only bitter. In fact, because of his own self-righteousness, He's not even able, let alone willing, to see his sin. The Proverbs tell us that only the fool is right in his own eyes. Proverbs 12, verse 15, The way of the fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. Proverbs 21, 2, Every man's way is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. <laughs> this is what's happening. Oh, he's right in his own eyes. He's got it all down. He knows what's going on. He's going to make it right. And so, and so what happens here? He's unwilling to go in. That's what it says. He, he will not go into this celebration and the Father comes to him. Once again, shocking the prodigal grace of God on display, an unfathomable compassion of God in verse 28, his father came out and began pleading with him. <laughs> Beloved, let's make no mistake here. God's mercy is new every morning. The father comes to seek and to save that which is lost. Like each one of us, like each one of us, the son here deserves the most harsh punishment because of his sin. He doesn't deserve for the father to come to him. He doesn't deserve to be even part of the celebration. He doesn't deserve to be even invited to the celebration. He deserves none of that. And yet here is the unfathomable compassion of the father By the way, by the way, the word used here in the original language is the same word, root word, that begins to describe the work of the Holy Spirit. The, the paraclete or the paracletos in the original language for the Holy Spirit, that same root word is used here. This is, this is God coming alongside, pleading. This is the Gospel. This is, this is God Himself pleading, won't you come? Please come. Don't stay out here. It's only going to end in your destruction. Let each one of us think about this. The Father comes out of love and the Father comes to actually help. He comes alongside the sinner to urge and to plead for him to come. Just as Jesus said in the previous parables, the lost sheep and the lost coin, that, that all of heaven's glory, all of those in heaven rejoice when one sinner comes to repentance. He's pleading with them to come. This is what the gospel is doing when it goes out. It's urging. It's pleading. This is what the Word of God 
does when it goes forth. It's, it's loving. It, it's urging. It's, it's pleading for the sinner to come. It's pleading for the self-righteous heart to turn from it and to embrace Jesus Christ by faith. It's pleading for you to not die in your sin. Ah, but in the pharisaical heart, all the unmitigated bitterness now floods the scene. And it spews out its own untempered view of self. Here's his view of himself. Verse 29. He answered and said to his father, look. That would have been shocking in that culture. No son would ever do that to their father. No son would ever speak to their father as if to say, listen, you sit down. I'll tell you a thing or two. Look. 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 For so many years I've been serving you. That's his view of self. All this time you haven't even noticed me. All this time I've been doing my dutiful duty for you. I've noticed never neglected a command of yours. I haven't failed you one time at one place in the smallest of ways. I've never done anything like that. I've never neglected anything of yours, and yet you, you have never given me the smallest of things. A young goat, a little kid of the the smallest of things that we have so that I might celebrate with my friends, those who are like me and those whom I love. For him... All the years that he has been practicing his own self-righteousness for the Father ended up in a dead-end street. He hasn't really loved the Father at all. That's not why he did it. That's not why he worked. He didn't work because he loved the Father. No, he's worked in order to earn the Father's love. He's hated every minute of it. He's disdained every sacrificial moment. That's why he says, I've never neglected you. I've never neglected a command. I have never failed at doing what you have commanded me to do. In other words, I have exercised perfect obedience. I've done it perfectly in your sight. Jesus is implying to the Pharisees of that day and to every Pharisaical heart that's listening to Him, listen, you want the exact same thing the young brother wanted. You've always wanted that. You just chose the deceptive path to get it. Your younger brother came out of boldness and out of right in front of everybody and said, "Ah, hey, Father, give me what is mine You came under the guise of a religious deception. Saying that you were with me, but you were not with me. You chose the deceptive path. Your own self-righteousness. I've never failed you, Father. Beloved, that's the pharisaical heart in full color, is it not? Hypocritical self-deception that convinces the one that lives by it that They are good enough. It's all an illusion. It's all smoke and mirrors. I've done all I need to do. And because I've done what I've done, the Father, and here we know that to be God Himself, He should recognize it. He should acknowledge it. How many times have you heard somebody say, I believe in Jesus and go about their life and it doesn't get any better. It gets a lot worse because they say they believe in Jesus. And then they walk away saying, I don't believe that anymore. Why? Because God never did anything for me. In fact, this one is even saying it's a travesty if you don't. You've never given me even a young goat 
So out of his untempered view of self, the pharisaical heart makes an unfair accusation of the Father. You've never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends, but when this son, verse 30, of yours, when he came, the one who's devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you see the juxtaposition going on? I haven't done that. I haven't been like him. He's much worse than I. I've been here serving you. I've been here giving to you. I've been here doing what you asked of me. But not that son. That's your son. I thought I was your son, but he's not even your son. I'm your son. It's an unfair accusation of the father. And so he goes from boasting of self, turns the blame on God. The reason I'm like this is because of you. For all the perfect service and all the perfect obedience that I've done, what did you give me, he says. You didn't even give me the smallest of things that I could celebrate with my friends. Implication, you're a bad father. You're a bad father to me. You should be grateful for what I've done for you. But you're not. Heard people say, I'll never serve a God like that. A God who judges the sinner. I'll never serve a God like that. A God who won't reward people for how good they are. No way. Beloved, that's a pharisaical heart. Mark it. Mark it. The host of heaven never rejoice for the self-righteous. The host of heaven never rejoice for the self-righteous. Heaven rejoices over one sinner who comes to repentance. Never does it rejoice for one or any number of self-righteous who boast in themselves. So the older son's heart is completely out of sync with the father. This is the anatomy of unbelief. Blinded to self, Unrealistic in its estimation of life, blaming of God for its current condition, unwilling to see anything that is true, completely out of sync with what God is doing. Rather than being sorry that the the brother had to go out in the first place and had to face the life he faced, and and now that he's repentant and come back, he he replaces or he, he rejoices with him. Instead of that, he's sorry that he's returned at all. Why? Because the pharisaical heart relies on performance rather than undeserved grace. That's what it relies on. When the son of yours came, you, you father, you're the reason we're in all this trouble. This is the pharisaical heart. Instead of repentance, instead of repentance, the pharisaical heart just recoils and accuses God for their life. Instead of acknowledging sin, the anatomy of unbelief, the pharisaical heart only sees the supposed perfection and spiritual maturity that they have. Instead of rejoicing at the reunion of A lost sinner that gets saved, the pharisaical heart only is hateful and accusatorial. And so from the incident and the interaction, we get the response. Here's the response, verse 31 and 32. And he said to him, this is the father once again, son, you've always been with me. All that is mine is yours. Once again, here's the father taking on the shame. All of the shame should be pointed at that son. All of the shame should be upon his head. And yet here is the father willing, willing and patiently to continue pleading with him and explaining to him and showing him out of prodigal grace that his perspective is wrong. Son, you've always been with me. All that is mine is yours. 
We had to celebrate. In other words, this is the spontaneous response of the glories of heaven. We had to celebrate and rejoice. Why? Because this brother of yours was dead. He now lives. He was lost. He's been found. Beloved, this is un, an undeserved explanation. An undeserved explanation. Why should a sinner turn to God? Well, not because God explains to you why. You should turn to God because He's God and you are not. This is an undeserved explanation. The father could have just answered this son out of his own wrath, in his own rightful anger, his own rightful justice. He could have denounced his wickedness and he could have revoked everything. He could have said, you're no longer my son. It's all now going to him, but he didn't. Instead, this lost prodigal son stands under the shower of prodigal grace. It's the final shocking reality in the story. The culture of Phariseeism dictates that if you dishonor the Father, you get what is coming. Sadly, we see this, unfortunately, happening all over the world today with those who have come to try to impose some kind of foolish human law called Sharia law on certain people, and they are beaten hammered, particularly women. The pharisaical heart, dishonor the Father, you're going to get what's coming. That's not what he got. At least not here. He got the tender love of the Father in words that should have really crushed his sin-sick pharisaical heart. It should have crushed him. All that's mine is yours. We had to celebrate. You notice the father says, this brother of yours was dead. He turns it right back. He says, you can't distance yourself from him. You can't distance yourself from his sin. You can't distance yourself from what he has received by me. You can't distance yourself at all from that. You're just like that. Think about it. What God has is ours. If we'll just turn from our sin. And even now we have what is best. Even now, even as an unbeliever, we have what is best. We have His Word to us. We have the Word of God so that we might come to Him and turn to Him and ask for forgiveness. And He grants Forgiveness to the repentant heart. But not the pharisaical heart. The pharisaical heart's just unable. It's unable to rejoice. Why? Because it refuses to see its own sin. So what does it do? It stays away from God. I, I don't need God. I don't, I don't need to be around God. It refuses to listen to God. It's kind of a shocking ending, isn't it? It's almost like it's almost like you're driving a car down this beautiful road and it's and you're you're seeing all the details come and then all of a sudden it drops off like a cliff. All the people would have been shocked at the outcome. Why? Because we don't, we don't get the final response of the Son. All we know is what the Son said. All we know is we see His anger flooding out. All we know is we see the answer of the pharisaical heart to God Himself. We see the response of God, but we don't know, we don't know what happened next. What did He do? What, what would we do if we were him? Well, 
That all depends on what you do with Jesus. Because in reality, we know what he did. He represents the Pharisees of the day. The Jewish leadership, those who carried out religious activity. That's who Jesus is addressing in this story. They are the older son. And their answer is known. We know what they did. The older son took the father and he picked up the hammer and got some nails and nailed him to the cross. That's what he did. He killed him like a common criminal. That's what the pharisaical heart still does with Jesus. That's why they don't want to hear it. And the question to us this morning, beloved, is simply this. Are we hearing? Are we listening? If not, we need to. We need to repent. Because each one of us is living under, right now, the prodigal grace of God. But there is coming a day when that grace will end. Don't wait. Because the Father is pleading, pleading. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for giving us this. Thank you for Luke recording it so that Theophilus might know the truth about Jesus Christ. Thank you that we have it so that we might know the truth about Jesus Christ. So that the anatomy of unbelief would be exposed to us so that the Pharisaical heart that might even be there in us as Christians which is hindering us in our own growth, would be exposed. And that the heart of the unbeliever would be laid bare, even here this morning, that they might hear your pleading from our words, that they might be arrested in their rejection of you, and like the younger son, come to their senses by your grace. And run to you. The only safe place is in your arms. And Lord we rejoice. We rejoice like the annals of heaven. Because you have saved us. Continue to grow us in Christ. Make us like your son. And erase in us any vestige of Phariseeism. No matter how it shows up. We just want to be like you. We would rejoice in all eternity because of that. So thank you for these things. Bless your name through us this day, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.